So I suppose the third problem as we start is that I have 35 minutes with you and we want to leave at least five minutes for questions. So that gives me 30 minutes to present uh, what is <laughs> ended up as 67 slides. Because, uh, so because today I'm, uh, so I'm here uh, from, from the Linux Foundation research team and I, we, we, the team has been publishing a lot of research in the last two years, 40 reports actually. And there are so many things I want to share with you and I just could not decide. In the end, I decided to summarize four reports. So that's 10% of our output. Um, and that itself is, is a lot. So I'll at some points just skip over some things that I think are maybe not that interesting um, or maybe yeah are not that important. So uh, let me start by saying it's nice to meet you. My name is Kaylin Osborne. Um, and today I'll be presenting um, on these four research reports. So I'll introduce them in a second. So the agenda. Quickly introduce the team and myself. Then very, very quickly uh, introduce some highlights from four reports. So the first one is the one I, I wrote. Uh, was anyone here at Anna's presentation on OSPOS? Okay, so Anna was a co-author. Uh, it's a shame she cannot be here. She's at the OSPO uh, happy hour having fun. Um, but anyway, I'll present some. This came out last week, so this is fresh off, off the press. And then here are three other studies which I did not write. Firstly, it's a study by a professor at UC Berkeley on measuring the economic value of open source software for companies. Next one is a, a study that came out two months ago about maintainers. And the, the, the fourth study is about uh, global collaboration and, and challenges that are caused by fragmentation. And then we'll leave five minutes for questions and answers. Um, okay, let's get started. So what is the Linux Foundation research team? Um, the kind of the mission is to investigate the impact of open source software projects, technologies, and standards. The team was founded two years ago. If you, this QR code will take you to the website uh, for the foundation's research, uh, the research team, and you'll see all our reports there. Uh, before the team was established, there were two big research studies conducted. One was just a, a history of development of the Linux kernel, and in 2020 was a, a contributor survey. And then after this, there was a lot of people commented that they, they found these reports interesting and useful and they wanted to see more of that. So then the foundation set up a research team dedicated to do, doing this kind of research. Um, the th kind of three broad research methodologies that are used are interviews, surveys, and also kind of big data analytics, you know, GitHub analytics, software, SCA, and so on. And as I said, um, 40 reports have been published. This team is led by Hilary Carter, who's the senior vice president of the Linux Foundation, highly prolific. Um, I myself have only written two of these, so I, I don't want to over claim what I have done <laughs> here. This is really much Hillary and, and the rest of the team have been doing work. And here are just some pictures of some of the other reports. And so today I'll talk about this one, this one, and this one. So five minutes in, let's move on. Okay, who am I? Uh, well. I joined last summer. I've been with the team for about 16 months. Um, I'm also a PhD candidate uh, at the University of Oxford where I research commercial participation in open source software projects. And the reason I'm in, in China at the moment is not just for KubeCon, but I'm visiting the open source software data analytics lab run by Professor Zhou Minghui at Beida. Um, and uh, yeah, this is if you're on Twitter, th that's my username. Okay, so let's start with this. This is a report that I wrote. It's on Europe, so just show me a, uh, your hands if you're interested in what's happening in Europe. Um, okay, three hands, or five hands. Okay, I won't spend too much time on this. Most of the slides are about this, so we're gonna, if we skip over it, it will be able to cover the whole presentation. So this is the report and the QR code if you wanna read it. Um, you'll also find it on the, the website, which the previous QR code took you to, so no worries. Um, background, uh, there's a lot of political interest in Europe about in digital sovereignty. And this goes back a few years. The French government in particular was the kind of driving force for this. Um, the COVID pandemic made this much more, gave much more fuel to this de debate because governments realized how dependent they were on a few platforms 
schools across Europe were running on mi Microsoft Teams, and uh, just you know the the services and applications provided by very few companies who were not European companies, mostly just um, U.S. American companies. So U European governments have been since then talking more and more about the need to uh, invest in the digital commons, which sorry, which includes open source software. Um, okay, there's interest and a lot of talk by politicians, but little action. There are lots of challenges. Many of you will be familiar with these. You know, vendor lock-in. Governments are in 20, 30-year contracts with, with uh, service providers. There's limited awareness amongst bureaucrats about the benefits of open-source software. There's limited training amongst uh, bureaucrats in development of open-source software. There's also a contribution uh, gap. This is a report that we published a year before, which shows uh, I mean, this was a survey about of a thousand practitioners uh, in Europe, uh, and the public sector, as you see, alongside education and finance and insurance, is one of the sectors that co that encourages contribution the least. What does that mean? Well, developers during working hours are not are not very much encouraged to uh, contribute to open source. So it's difficult to realize these political interests that politicians talk about when this is the reality. So our objectives here were to understand the state of open source in the public sector across Europe, identify barriers and enablers for shifting to open source or increasing open source activity, and also identify priorities. So I'll just quickly go over this. We spoke to 30 people from 14 countries in Europe. Um, and yeah, key findings. So with all this political talk about open source and digital commons, there's an increasing recognition of the value you know, cost savings, control, localization, and reducing vendor lock-in. Um, but a lot of the people we spoke to who, um, well, how, how many people know what an OSPO is? So of course you will know because you came to OSPO talk, but how, put your hand up if you know what OSPO is. Uh, open source program offices. These are dedicated offices or teams within organizations, not just industry, but increasingly governments, uh, which are, yes, focused on open source software. And I think and when we did this research this summer, f either 12, yeah, 12 countries in Europe out of 27 had a dedicated OSPO. They're not always called OSPO, they have different names and like, but uh, you know, they come in different shapes and sizes. Um, and we spoke, to, we spoke to the representatives of these teams and they said um, what they want from their politicians and what, what they want from their senior ma leadership is systematic endorsements and resources. So money going towards the things, not just comments. So, as I said, digital sovereignty is very important. Um, events like log for shell also uh, drew attention to the importance of cybersecurity. Um, Germany did a very, the German government did a very, I'm, I'm, I'm German, so I'm, I'm not, not saying this because I'm German, but I think the German government did very, something very quite awesome. In October last year, they set up a fund called the Sovereign Tech Fund. Has anyone heard of it? Oh, so in its first year of running, it has a budget of 11 million euros. And it's dedicated to giving, basically funding open source software projects that it sees as critical dependencies for the German government. And how it works is open source software projects or foundations can apply they have to, uh, uh, for basically a grant and they get it. So for example, OpenJS, which is part of the Linux Foundation, uh, I believe received 500,000 euros for one year's of work to hire maintainers to work on, uh, on cybersecurity within the product, uh, ecosystem. So that's really cool, so that, um, but that's an exception. That's the only government that has set up something like that. I spoke to Fiona from the Sovereign Tech Fund. She said, we need more actors because funding is, and maintenance is very important, but we also need more co coordination um, because it's great to see other organizations getting involved in open source software funding. This, this includes the private sector, this includes philanthropies, and now governments, but everyone is pushing in different directions. And there's very little coordination between them. So she, she said, from her perspective, it would be great if there could be more coordination. Okay, I'm moving very fast, lots of information, so I'm sorry for that. I thought this was a really interesting point from Boris. He's based in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. He said, Europe is in a very lucky position most countries in Europe have policies and laws about open source software use. That's not the problem. The problem is actually implementing these laws. One of his compatriots from the interior ministry of the Dutch government told me uh, for many years they've had this law called open source unless. What does this law mean? Well, if the government develops IT systems or software systems, 
they have to open source it unless they have justifiable reasons not to. And hi in his opinion, this is the least followed policy in the whole country. And why is that? Well, he said, well, people just don't know how to implement it. And often that's the justifiable reason. That means they don't know, like, you know, what the legal or even technical pro procedures are to open source software from the government. So what many people emphasize, and many were from OSPOs, so it's a biased sample, uh, OSPOs are a key mechanism for facilitating contributions to the open source software ecosystem, including, you know, actually implementing the open source and less policy uh, or funding open source software projects or just turning up to events like this. Um, this is a view from Leonardo, who used to be head of open source for the Italian government. He says, you know, most organizations just consume and use open source software and, and, and very few give back. Um, and he sees OSPOs as the key way of contributing back. Um, one of the things they do, and so he talked about his experience at the Italian government, is create catalogs, um, which basically help with the discoverability problem. So basically, if you're a developer working in one of the ministries of your government, knowing, okay, what other projects have other developers within the government apparatus in a different ministry, or maybe at a regional level or a local level, what have they been building, and can I reuse any of that? So that's very useful. France has also created one, and France has done something very interesting. It's called the SIL. Um, they've created basically a social network around their catalog. So basically, let's say you focus on the Linux kernel, right? And you are a PyTorch expert. You are not just using the catalog, but you can share that you are an expert. So you become a referent, as they call it. And say you come along and you want to learn about both Linux, the Linux kernel and PyTorch. And then it will, it will, it will, it will point you in the direction of these two uh, developers within the government. So you never have met them. But you know, okay, they have expertise in the technology that you want to work on, and they are work within the same organization as you. And so it, he said through that, so the person I spoke to said through that, a lot of developers were starting to, to get to know each other and share uh, resources and build capacity. So that's been very useful. Guidance is, of course, very useful as well. Um, this is an interesting point from the CTO of Estonia. So he said, building something this is about the discoverability problem. Um, it's great if you build something and open source it, but that doesn't necessarily guarantee that people will come and use it. Um, this is probably quite familiar to all of you. Um, and so he said he emphasized the, you know, these catalogs and um, kind of guidance documents are, are useful for um, getting people to, to come to your, to, to your project and, and contribute to it. Okay, so I'm sorry, that was a lot of information about a report that maybe is not that interesting to you because it's about what's happening <laughs> in Europe. So now I'm gonna talk about more generalizable uh, findings um, and how we're we doing for time. Um, okay, we have uh, 17 more minutes. Okay, so this study is on measuring the economic value of open source. Here's the QR code. And this was run by Professor Henry Chesbrough at Berkeley. Um, I'll give you a second to see the QR code. So it's based on U.S. companies, but I think it, I assume it is generalizable across the, US, uh, across the world. And I'll give you my reasons why. So the survey was sent to CIOs and IT managers at Fortune 500 companies, as well as companies that could be reached through Linux Foundation, as well as uh, members of the Berkeley Innovation Forum who are also Fortune 500 companies. And this resulted in 439 re reusable responses. So because of the mixture of the um, distribution of the, of the survey, we cannot say that all these 439 responses correspond to 439 Fortune 500 companies, but roughly. And here you si see the diversity of the sizes of the companies. So what did he find? OK, here's a lot of information, um, but we see a lot of um, the kind of key benefits and key costs or risks of open source are pretty much standard, have been uh, kind of repeated over and confirmed over the last 20 years. So, sorry, information overload, but here are the kind of main benefits. Draw your attention to these three. So the three main benefits according to Fortune 500 companies in the US are faster development speeds, cost savings, and open standards and interoperability. I assume that doesn't surprise anybody. When it comes to the to the costs, if anyone wants to take a photo of that, you can take a photo quickly. Um, 
otherwise you'll see it in the report. When it comes to the costs, the three main ones are hidden support costs, cost due to security gaps, and costs for training. Um, did anyone expect any other kind of major costs to, to come up that you don't see here? Yeah, I think it's pretty straightforward, right? But I think the, the value of summarizing the costs and the benefits in this way is that you can put them in front of decision makers, whether it's in governments, as I was just talking about, or in companies that are not that active in open source software. And it kind of gives you a very useful summary of what the main benefits and costs are. So hopefully um, stakeholders who are not already believers and supporters of open source will find this useful. Okay, the, the third report. Um, this is about maintainers. So here's the QR code, if anyone wants to uh, take it quickly. The methodology here was to interview 32 super maintainers from various projects hosted by the Linux Foundation. Um, so I'll get more. I'll talk more about the methodology in a, sec uh, a second. But this is like the re you know the reason why you know we all know that maintainer burnout is real. Everyone recognizes this diagram, right? Does it, is this the first time for anyone seeing this? Okay, so everyone everyone knows that, right? So maintainer burnout is real. Um, so the aim of this study was to examine the practices of super maintainers. Uh, I'll, def I'll define what super maintainers means in a second and, and identify key sustainability factors and then provide insights into how we can support maintainers. So how did we select which super maintainers we spoke to? Well, so this is, uh, I'm just sh showing another. I, I wanted to include this in the presentation, but I already had four, so. Uh, <laughs> um, this is a previous study by researchers at Harvard University, and it was for the Linux Foundation, where um, they analyzed, identified the most, you know, the most, you know, most common dependencies doing um, software composition analysis. And this ended up with a you know big ranked list of, of software, open source software projects. And then so the methodology here was to select maintainers of these, the mo you know, the highest ranked de uh, dependencies. So that's what super maintainer means. And to cover a range of different uh, domains. So front end libraries, operating systems, infrastructure, package managers, databases and storage, DevOps uh, tools, uh, and data analysis and AI and yeah, lower level languages. Um, so we got a kind of a range of projects in the sample. The key findings, here's a lot. Um, for me, this was the most striking one. That only 35% of these super maintainers have a contributor uh, pipeline. You know, you know uh, who here has heard of the bus factor? The bus factor, is this, is this a new concept? Oh, so the bus factor um, measures how many developers or contributors make up at least 50% of contributions. And it goes back to the 90s when people talked about the role of Linus Torvalds in, in the Linux kernel. And someone said, well, what happens if Linus gets hit by a bus? He will not be able to contribute anymore. So since then, people or researchers <laughs> talk about the bus factor, which is quite morbid, um, but basically is a measure of dependence on individuals. And so if, if some of these ma super maintainers decide that they cannot continue, well, they're in a pro they have a problem if they don't have a contributor pipeline for training and mentoring uh, contributors who can then step up and become maintainers. So they shared a bunch of best practices. I'm just gonna highlight six categories of best practices. The first one is about, is any, wait, sorry, is anyone here a maintainer? I'm sure you are. Um, do any of these resonate with you? Do you do any of these yourself? We can focus on this box because then we'll move on. You ha what's your project? Uh, it's something called Graph Database. It's a graph database. So uh, it's a very large project. We have uh, uh, more than 9,000 stars in GitHub. So we have uh, greeting mechanisms. We have the uh, the group first issues, um, uh, a list of uh, simple issues or bugs for the newcomers to do. Yeah. How effective do you find that? 
Uh, it used to be effective, <laughs> but we do have a serious uh, pipeline issue. We don't have many new contributors coming, so um, <laughs> so yeah, it used to be effective. <laughs> Are you considering any other uh, tools or ways of reaching out to new contributors? We are waiting for our uh, 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 incoming GA of our new uh, version, uh, which we, we rely on it to boost our open source co contributions. After that, we may uh, rebuild our contributor pipelines and, and we will reinstate uh, these measures. Uh, we, we, we will hope that will um, help the contributions. We should uh, bring out a second version of this report with this, uh, these insights. Um, so then, yeah, community governance is important, establishing code of conduct. I think the second one is interesting. Design yourself out of the job. This relates to the bus factor. So basically, ensuring that your project can continue without you. Um, so we have to put your pride to the side and uh, think in terms of the interest of the longevity, the sustainability of your project. Okay, um, and yeah, distributing power and decision making is very, very important, of course. Documentation. Um, wait, do we have any other maintainers? Because uh, I, I don't want to just pick on you and ask you. <laughs> Are you a maintainer too? Uh, different project or same project? Different, okay. Um, do you want to comment on documentation or any of the? Yeah, uh, that's fine. Documentation, so I ra raise my hand. I'm from uh, Kublux. It is. Um, an operator actually for multi uh, database management, uh, multiple cloud, and uh, you can check out what booth in the first floor. And the uh, last month, I spent a lot of my time on documentation because many users would complain how to contribute to your project or how to use the project better. And uh, I'm also doing the second, uh, I uh, second second one recruiting some doc document writers from our community to contribute to their ideas or their experience or how they can successfully run our projects. Yeah, I think that's very useful. And uh, their experience, when they share the experience out, it will help more like our users or potential users. Yeah. So, moving on. Some time is running out. Uh, here are three other categories of best practices. Um, so the first one is diversity. Um, you know, mentoring is really important for bringing in new people and training them up. Um, a major problem that was brought up is, well, of course, there's a certain geek culture, but also a cultural dynamic here. A lot of the projects are U.S. centric. And many contributors who are not American might find it difficult to, to climb the ranks and become a maintainer in a, in a project that is, tec is technically global in nature, but it might feel like an American project. And this, c this can include like, you know, the language that is used. And do we have something about language? Um, no, but later on in the presentation, I'll talk about this. But yeah, just basically making it feel like an inclusive global community rather than just um, you know, the culture of, of, of one place in the world. Um, avoiding burnout, is this something that the two of you can relate to? Have you burned out from your, wait, so let me step back. Are you paid to do your maintenance work as part of your job? Okay, so you're not doing it on the weekend. Excellent. So your, your company or your organization supports you? Okay. So. Would you agree that that's an important reason why you have not burned out? Uh, yes. So I think this is a problem amongst um, maintainers who are not doing this as part of their jobs, who are just doing it on a voluntary basis, after work, on the weekends, and so on. And then funding. Um, so in the inter interest of time, I'll move on. And this is the last study. So thank you, you've, made, you've done three out of four. Um, so this one came out in February. And yeah, as, as, as the title says, it's about, we basically the study interviewed open source software leaders from projects and foundations. 
what they saw as the biggest challenges and, and priorities for the global open source software ecosystem. And this project is probably maybe the one that is most relevant uh, uh, to, to China or to a Chinese audience. So, yeah, we spoke to a bunch of people. I won't focus on the methodology, key findings. So open source has changed a lot in the last 30 years. Um, as I just mentioned before, you know, it has its roots in Western Europe and North America, but it's truly a, um, a global community. And um, that brings with it language, culture, and geopolitics uh, barriers. It's not part of this presentation um, because it's not from the Linux Foundation, but my favorite, favorite book, uh, or, uh, my favorite, I'll share two things with you. My favorite book, which was written by a Russian scholar at Stanford in the US about developers of Lua in Brazil, in Rio. So put your hand up if you know Lua. Okay, some of you. So some of the problems that these guys in, in Rio de Janeiro had is that you know, they speak Portuguese with each other but the lingua franca of the kind of the global open source uh, community is English. And they were finding it very difficult to, to contribute. And at the beginning, he spent five years researching these guys. And at the beginning, he, oh, he could speak Russian, he could speak English, but he could not speak Portuguese. Uh, so he was speaking with them in English, and then maybe, say, let's say you speak very good English and you don't speak good English. If I spoke, if when he spoke to you privately, you would speak very well. And when he, but when you spoke in front of, sorry, what is your name? When he spoke in front of you, he would reduce the quality of his English because basically your ability to speak English reflects your social status, you know, what your education background is, how wealthy you are, and so on. So he, he in this book, he, this is not the focus, but this is just one chapter, he talks about the, 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 the politics of language ability for developers, open source software developers who co don't come from English speaking countries. Very interesting. The second one is a report. I should have this, these written down. I'm sorry. Is by a, a woman from Bangladesh who was based at Berkeley, and she got a, a grant from the Ford Foundation to research open source communities in Bangladesh, and she looked at communities of Rasta and Brave, and uh, no, sorry, Mozilla and Brave, and a lot of these volunteers are high school students or university students um, who are you know contributing. Why? Well, they want to basically build up a portfolio so that they can get a job. Um, and you know, just studying computer science or electro elec uh, electrical engineering or mathematics is not enough. Um, and their dream, she says, is to, to work for you know, a big international technology company, um, but by just doing very local community work in a city in Bangladesh. Anyway, so those are very interesting studies about um, the kind of experiences of developers who are not from English-speaking countries, and maybe some of those challenges resonate with you as as developer Chinese speakers uh, in um, English-speaking environments. Um, another challenge is techno-nationalism. Um, you saw this definitely during the uh, the Trump era uh, with the trade wars, and so that that's a major concern. Um, here's the last set of findings. So. What do I focus on here? So this is, I think, the one that I, I, I want to focus on here, which is there are so many foundations. You know, Linux Foundation is one with lots of daughter foundations. But it's not the only one. Open Atom Foundation, uh, Eclipse Foundation, and so on and so forth. Um, and so an outcome of this was, um, oh, let me get, I'll come back to this. An outcome of this was in July, uh, this Congress w took place with foundations from around the world uh, to talk about um, kind of shared priorities and looking at ways how they can coordinate to make sure they're not just duplicating the same efforts. Um, I just want to share some th insights from three different people we interviewed. The first one is from Mexico. Um, and this is, I talked earlier about um, the problem that people from outside the USA experience when they want to contribute to open source software projects. And he said in Mexico, a lot of developers struggle with this. In Mexico, their ability to speak English is quite good, uh, but of course they're Spanish speakers. So he said, um, the language barrier can be difficult. Uh, the perspective from Huawei, um, that geopolitical conflicts were fragmenting open source. We see this with um, you know the last couple of years. 
And then also in Europe, digital sovereignty is very important. And European governments want to kind of cut their dependence on US tech companies. So I think I've just managed to go through 67 slides in 30 minutes. So thank you for um, suffering through this session with me. <laughs> I hope it was interesting. And uh, we've left some time for some questions. Um, so uh, please ask me questions. Uh, we have nine minutes. Yeah. So uh, since you're visiting, uh, I think you're visiting Peking University, right? So, uh, so since you are visiting China, are you comparing the open source communities in China with that in Europe? And I think to some extent the European community and the Chinese open source community may share some common problems like uh, a lot of the projects and their core contributors are from the United States. And we, we do share this so pr problem that we want to have more homegrown or independent open sources that are not that American. So what's your opinion on this? Are you doing this comparative study in China during the week? So it's not the focus uh, of my own research. And I should say when I'm at Beida, I'm not, uh, while I'm at Beida for the next six months, I'm not part of Linux Foundation research. It's just academic research as a PhD student. My research focuses on commercial participation. And I'm interested in how different types of company managed open source software projects, uh, how collaboration takes place between companies in those projects. Because academics so far have only studied how companies collaborate together in community-led projects. But we haven't, we basically, company-led pro projects, which are, is very common, which come in different types of, with different types of community structures, have never been studied. So that's what I'm studying. However, um, I've had three weeks there now, and there's a lot of interest from my lab about doing these kind of studies. And one thing that we might look at is, uh, are you familiar with scikit-learn? It's a machine, Python library for machine learning. Developed, the core maintainers are mostly in, in France at the National French Computer Science Research Center called INRIA. And um, for my PhD, I, I did a study on their funding model because I think it's interesting in the field of AI, which is you know, where, most popular, where the most popular open source software libraries for machine learning or AI are developed by big tech companies. But they are just a few academics in Paris. Uh, you know, they don't earn millions, and there are a few of them, but they have a, made a really strong community. So I'm interested, how were they able to sustain themselves? And so I was speaking, I visited them many times, and the community manager, Francois, showed me a dashboard of their contributors. So he showed me a map of stargazers, and about 35% of stargazers are in China. Um, and then followed by, I think, USA, Germany, UK, France, and so on. And then when he changed to issues and pull requests, and then even worse, commits, China goes from like you know, over 30% to less than 3%. And the USA, France, UK, Germany go up. And I asked him, you know, what is happening here? And he said, there's a fork where a lot of Chinese developers are working in Chinese. And then there are a few who contribute back, who can speak, who are, who are bilingual. Um, and so one of the studies where my, my colleague uh, Beda and I want to look at is the process, the role, you know, process of collaboration between the fork and the actual project, and then and the role of these, uh, I don't know how many, I think, let's say two or three uh, bilingual developers who speak English and Chinese, the role they're playing to diffuse information in two ways, you know? Um, so that's something. Another thing is looking at, um, I know one of my colleagues is interested in um, international collaboration on Kitty, so not just um, in China. But yeah, anyway, that's hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> Any more questions? We have five more minutes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, okay. so um, from your slide, that uh, some of the um, like most popular open source projects are maintained by a few, a handful of super maintainers. Yeah. So, is there any study around what keeps motivates these um, these super maintainers? In my opinion, I, I don't think like free open source project, the maintainers are doing it for free. So, uh, what are those like major motivations for them to keep working on their projects? Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you for your question. Um, here, this is the. So, studies about maintainers. Um, my favorite study about maintainers that kind of covers this, it doesn't specifically answer your question, but it, it covers this, is a book called o Working in, 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 the, in Public 
the making and maintenance of open source software. And written by um, Nadia Egbal, and she was a researcher at GitHub for two years, where she just spoke to hundreds of <laughs> maintainers. That was her job. And uh, she published this book, which is also, uh, I think it's open access, but don't quote me on this, where she basically talks about you know, why maintainers maintain open source software. And as you might imagine, the, the reasons are you know, many. You know, there are many reasons. And the, uh, there are lots of factors to consider. Firstly is, are they being paid to do this or not? Um, she has a statistic in her book, which I, uh, I can't, can't remember, but many are. You know, let's say around 50%, maybe more. Um, there are many different types of projects. So she gives four examples of projects. She has names for them, like a stadium. A stadium, for example, is where you have a few maintainers and core developers, and then lots of users, basically lots of people watching it. Um, another one is like, um, you know, f basically the two, two axes are develop uh, contributors and users, basically. So there are like four quadrants. And she finds in each of those quadrants, so I'll say like low use, low development, or low use, high development, high development, lots of use, or whatever. The maintainers of those different types of projects have different motivations and resources. So hopefully that answers your question, but basically there's no simple answer. Sure. Uh, what's, what's the name of the book again? Um, I wish I could write it down. Um, it's called Working in Public. The Making and Maintenance of Open Source Software. Perfect. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. I think we have time for one more question. OK, if there are more questions, I, I just want to ask you one question. Um, you know, I'm coming from Europe where everyone is talking about digital, so not everyone, but uh, digital sovereignty. And sometimes when you're you know, so deep into something, it's hard to see outside. So how common is this term to you? Are you familiar? Did you, have you heard of this term, digital sovereignty, before today? Okay. It's completely new. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, yeah, OK, thanks. That's, that answers my question. <laughs> so what is the concept in China? Wait, do you want to? Uh, the term is uh, you, you, you have the ability, capability to control the software independently. So th I, I think that, that, that that's the idea. I think it's similar to digital sovereignty. It's like yeah. you, you own the intellectual property. Yeah. If there are security risks and, and you know it, you know how to fix it, and you have the power to right. control its development and uh, commercialization and so on. So yeah, I think that's that sounds very I think, very I think that's a Chinese term for digital sovereignty. OK, thank I you. Guess. The other term that we see uh, being used in Europe is strategic autonomy. But strategic autonomy, so digital sovereignty is a subset of strategic autonomy. Uh, yeah. Sounds similar. Yes. OK, I think we're at time. So I'll wrap up here. Thank you all very, very much. Um, Please, um, if, if you found the reports interesting, um, check them out on our website. Uh, please feel free to ask me any questions if you see me. And please forgive me for only having 18 stickers. Uh, next time, I'll come with more. Uh, thank you.